God's doing a lot, and it's not anything that we've done to make it happen. We've just, you know, I've, I've learned that when, when you trust Christ to be your life source, what he does through you so far surpasses anything that you could do for him. You know that? I spent a lot of years trying to do things for Jesus, and I finally gave up and said, I can't do it for him. I just can't be consistent. I can't succeed. And uh, if you've read my first book, Grace Walk, you have read in that book how I came to the end of myself in 1990 and I said, Lord, I give up. I quit. I'm not going to try to do anything for you anymore. I'm not going to uh, take, uh, I'm just going to quit trying and I'm going to trust you. I'm yours. Ministry's yours. If you want to do something with me, if you want to do something with the ministry, then this is yours. And for everything that I like that happens and everything somebody says something good about, I'm going to say it's all him. And I said, and for everything that I don't like or everything people criticize, I'm going to say, it's all him. (laughs) Because it's your ministry. And uh, shortly after that time of total commitment, I'll never forget, a guy came to the, I was still a local pastor. I was a local church pastor for 21 years. I left the pastor in 1994 and have been traveling. We've been on six continents since then. But uh, after I prayed that prayer and came to that place, I remember the day that my secretary came in and said, there's a guy at the door. Uh, outside in the waiting room, he wants to come in and talk to you about the congregation, about attending here. I said, okay, bring him in. So he came in, and uh, the guy was from uh, Cameroon. And the first question he asked me is, what does it cost? How much do I have to pay to attend church here? And I thought, wow, this guy's starting from zero for sure. There have been people that attend here for years that don't know anything about giving money when they come here. So this guy... (laughs) So anyway, uh, I began to share with the guy, and... and, uh, make a long story short, I, I realized, of course, as soon as the guy didn't know the Lord, and I shared the gospel of grace with him, and he trusted Christ, and he started coming to my office every week to be discipled. And whereas when I was a legalist, I would have told him all the things he should do, and he ought to do, and he ought not to do. Well, I, instead, I was going to disciple the guy under grace, and I began to teach him who he is in Christ, and what it means for Jesus to live his life through you. And after, I don't know, six, seven weeks, I don't know, after a while, him coming every Tuesday, he asked me, he said, Steve, have you noticed that every time I come when you're discipling me, I take notes? I said, yeah, and he did. He was just constantly writing everything I'd say. I said, yeah. He said, do you know why? I said, I assume you go back to your apartment and study them. The guy was in Atlanta, Georgia, studying at a university in preparation to going back home and being a hospital administrator. I said, I assume you're studying the notes that you take from what I'm teaching you. He said, no. He said, every week when I leave here, he said, I go over here to mailboxes, etc., a shipping place. And he said, I put all my notes in a package and I ship them to the chief of my village in Cameroon. And every week when the chief gets it the next week, he calls the whole village together and he's sharing with them the things that you're teaching me. And this guy, Philippe, said to me, he said, a lot of the people in my village are trusting Christ because of what the chief is sharing with them. And they're asking the chief questions, and he doesn't know how to answer them. So he's writing me to answer answer the questions, and I don't know the answers. So I'm wondering, if I translate for you, will you give the answers to the questions the new Christians in my village at home have? I thought, good grief. I thought, here, all these years I've been trying to do something for Jesus. And I give up the silly idea that I can do anything for him as if he needed me. And instead, I just say, it's you. You do it however you want. Do it through me. And now here I'm sitting here in my office in Atlanta, Georgia, with one young black man sitting across the desk from me, and I'm evangelizing and discipling a whole village of people in Africa. Only God can do that. You you can't make that kind of thing happen. Only he can do that. I want to tell you something. He can do more in your life and through your life in an hour than you could do in 20 lifetimes. So the key is just quit trying. Just stop trying and start trusting. Just get, cut yourself some slack. A guy was at my house spraying for pest control this last week. The, just, just the day before I came here, in fact. He was spraying my house for pest control and doing the termite inspection and, and all of this kind of stuff. And, and he says, to, I've given him a book. We'd talked before. I'd given him a book. I knew he was a believer. And he says, he says you know, he said, I said, how's it going for you? He said, man, it's been going bad. It's been going bad. I said, really? I said, I'm sorry to hear that. He said, yeah. He said, I made up my mind I was going to read the Word and pray with my wife and children every day. And he said, you know something? He said, some days I don't do it. He said, and I had I said I was going to do it every day, but some days I don't do it. I don't read the Word and pray with my family in the evening like I said I would. And he said, man, when I don't, bad things happen. He said, it just unravels. Bad things happen. He said, what do you think? I said, I don't think that's the case at all. He said, what do you mean? I said, I mean, you're trying to connect dots where dots don't connect. 
bad things aren't happening because you don't read the Bible with your family one night. I said, what, you just have this belief system, this faulty belief that says, I have to read the Bible with my family and pray with them or bad things will happen. That's your belief. So then when bad things happen, if you're reading the Bible and praying, you just think, well, that was a bad thing. But if you miss reading your Bible and praying with your family and a bad thing happens, you say, see, that happened because I didn't read my Bible and pray with my family. And I said, and you're connecting dots where they don't dot connect. I said, here's, he said, well, what do you think about it? I said, well, here's a better idea. Rather than put yourself under the law, because Romans 7, 5 says sinful passions stir up uh, or aroused by the law, stirred up by the law. 1 Corinthians 15 says the power of sin is religious rules, the law. Rather than put yourself under religious rules and beat yourself up for the days that you don't read the Bible and pray with your family, why don't you celebrate the days that you do read the Bible and pray with your family? I said, if you're reading the Bible and praying with your children and, and, and your wife because you want to and you love Jesus, that's wonderful and it brings joy to your father. I said, not because you're doing that as a gift to him, but because that is a gift he's given to you to be able to celebrate his life together as a family. And I said, he, he loves you whether you read the Bible with him or not. And the guy, he's out here spraying around the house, his eyes fill with tears and he says, you, that's going to make me cry. I said, why? He said, because it gives me such a relief. I said, that's what grace does. Yes. That's what grace does. It gives you a relief. It's a rest. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is anybody, easy, and my burden is light. Jesus described this life he's given us in himself, and he described it with the words rest, easy, and light. Really? For the first 29 years of my life as a believer, if you had asked me to describe the Christian life, I can promise you those three words wouldn't have appeared on my list. You know, I, I remember the poem from years ago. Mary had a little lamb, used to be a sheep, and then it joined a local church and died from lack of sleep. <laughs> I thought we were saved to serve and God needed us to do things for him. The Bible plainly says in the book of Acts, God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. I used to say silly things. I'd say things like, I'd rather burn out than rust out. You ever heard that? I'd rather burn out than rust out. And then one day the Lord showed me, either way you're out. <laughs> devil doesn't care if you burn out or rust out as long as you're out. And so it's just a silly notion that we have of what God expects. Let me tell you, the, the, a good starting point with a life of grace is to show yourself some grace. Yes. I mean, if, if, if we, need to be, we need to be gracious to ourselves. And, and I know to the legalist mind that idea is scary, it's terrifying. Because they're afraid that if you show grace to yourself, then you might just quit doing everything that you think you ought to do and start doing all those wrong things that you think you know, right now that you ought not to do. But the truth is this, that viewpoint is an insult to the Holy Spirit of Jesus who lives in us. The Spirit of Christ that lives in you is quite capable of motivating godly behavior, activating godly behavior, and perpetuating godly behavior. Whereas religious rules will defeat you every single time. Every time. Here's the good news of the gospel. You ready? You can relax. It's finished. You can relax. If I could give a word of advice to the modern church that I believe would usher in a reformation, if Christians would just take this word of advice, it would consist of two words, and it's this. Chill out. It's okay. Your father's already got it. And that brings me to what I want to talk about today, which is the vicarious life of Jesus Christ. Vicarious life of Jesus Christ. If you had asked me uh, many years ago, before I began to understand grace, if you had asked me uh, what was the purpose for Jesus coming into this world, I would have said, and you've probably heard it said at times through life, Jesus came to die. He was born to die. And that was the sentiment. Even at Christmas time, 
as a pastor, when I would talk about the incarnation and the coming of Jesus, I would frame the birth of Jesus with the overshadowing cross on the manger, and I would make sure people knew that the only reason he came into this world was to die for your sin. Now, don't misunderstand me. Jesus did die and take our sin upon himself, and in no way would I want to minimize the finished work of the cross, but what I want to show you today that I believe can encourage you as you live your life from day to day is that Jesus didn't come just to die on your behalf, but he also came to live on your behalf. The life of Jesus is as much for you as was the death of Jesus. When he came into this world, he didn't die right away. He lived about 33 years before he died. Now, why did he stay here 33 years if the only thing he came to do was die? He could have died sooner than that. Well, it's because his life encompasses, his incarnation encompasses much more than just his death. He didn't simply die for you. He lived and died as you. Now, think of the word vicarious. It means on the behalf of another person to substitute to take somebody else's place. So if we look at the vicarious aspect of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, most every Christian, at least, recognizes that he died on our behalf and that his death on the cross was, I'll call it, a stand-in for us. We would say his death on the cross was in our place. It was a substitutionary death, no doubt about it. Now, I won't have time today to get into the details of what I'm about to say, but when Jesus died that substitutionary death on the cross, it wasn't God the Father punishing him in your place. I've done teaching series on this whole subject. I've got a series called Living in Heaven's Embrace, and I'll go ahead and give the commercial and plug it. You can go on my website, and under the resource tab, you can find it, Living in Heaven's Embrace. That whole idea is called uh, penal substitution, penal as in penitentiary punishment. He was punished by the Father in our place. No, no. God the Father was never divided against his Son and punished him, mad at him, because so he wouldn't have to be mad at you and punish you. Jesus was punished indeed, but he was punished by sin. When he took your sin into himself, sin punished Jesus. The same way that poor diet and exercise habits will punish a person physically. It's not God that punishes that person. It's the poor diet and poor exercise habits that bring punishment to their physical bodies. In the same way, it was sin that brought death to Jesus, not his father. The wages of sin is death. It's sin that kills, not God the Father. To the contrary, at the cross, the Father, Son, and Spirit were all involved in this joint rescue mission. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And the writer of Hebrews says that he offered himself by the eternal Spirit. So it's the triune God that worked to rescue us at the cross. But when I say his death was substitutionary, you understand that. But did you know that his life too was substitutionary? George Hunsinger wrote a book interpreting Karl Barth, who often needs to be interpreted. And Hunsinger said this, interpreting Barth. He said, when God comes to humanity in the history of Jesus Christ, humanity at the same time is brought to God in that history, objectively. It is not faith which incorporates humanity into Jesus Christ. Faith is rather the acknowledgement of a mysterious incorporation already objectively accomplished on humanity's behalf. Let me, let me tell you what Jesus did for us. He did whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not. He did what he did. Now, if you don't know it, you're certainly not going to benefit from it. In Hebrews 4.2, the scripture says that the same gospel that was declared to us, believers, was declared to them also, unbelievers. But the message did not benefit them because they did not combine the truth with faith. New King James, look at it in this version. The gospel was preached to us as well as to them. It was the same gospel. But the word or message that they heard did not profit them. Why? Because it was not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. And so that they didn't profit from it. They didn't benefit from it. If somebody were to give you... Uh, uh, great wealth, if they were to leave you a great sum of money, 
uh, upon their death and the money were to be deposited into your account, if you didn't know it, would it still be your money? Sure it would. It's in your bank account. What if you were told but you didn't believe it? Is it still your money? Of course it is, but you wouldn't benefit from it. The only way you could benefit from it is to know it and believe it. Anything short of that, it would still be your money, but you would not benefit. And what Jesus Christ has done for humanity, he's done for all of us. But the only way anybody's going to benefit is by believing. The accusations that are hurled against those of us who teach this kind of biblical grace are outrageous. There are people who will say that folks like myself or Caleb or Mike or others that are teaching this message, you, all you got to do is... Uh, is, is, is just casually scan the internet, you'll see that they're talking about these hyper-grace teachers who believe you're going to heaven whether you believe in Jesus or not. That's ridiculous. I don't know anybody that's saying that. No. No, we're not saying you don't have to believe in Jesus. Of course you need to believe in Jesus or you will not profit from the finished work of Christ. You will not benefit from it personally. But the fact that you don't believe it doesn't make the cross be a failure. The success of the cross doesn't depend on my faith. It doesn't depend on my belief. Shall my faithlessness make the word of God of no effect, Paul asked? And then he answered, God forbid. God has done what he has done, and he didn't need me to give a vote on it to make it successful. But I can enter into the experience of that objective finished work of Jesus, or like that uh, brother, older brother in Luke 15, the brother of the prodigal son, I can choose to stand out in outer darkness while there's a party going on inside. I'm still a son I still have all the rights and privileges of the one who's enjoying the party, but if my own stubborn pride keeps me from entering in and accepting his acceptance, then I can stand in outer darkness potentially forever and ever. But it's not because I've been put out, and it's not because the father didn't want me in, because there in the prodigal son story in Luke 15, the father's out there in the outer darkness with the son. So he wasn't experiencing the party, but it wasn't the father's fault. Everything going on in that party was his birthright. He wasn't experiencing because he wouldn't believe it. You know, if this is a message for unbelievers. You have, you have been accepted by God, now accept him. He's received you, now receive him. That's the, that's the rest. The proclamation is God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The question, that's, a, that's an active participle, reconciling. The world to himself. Well, did he succeed or fail? <laughs> he succeeded. Amen. Not counting their sins against them. God's not counting anybody's sins against them anymore. There's nobody's sin on the planet that's being held against them by God. People don't miss heaven because of the sinful things they're doing. People miss experiencing heaven because they won't believe in the finished work of Jesus. And sin brings condemnation, not God. Sin brings condemnation. And those that believe are not condemned. Why? Because they've received the cure for that condemnation sin brings. But those that don't believe are condemned already. Why? Because they've not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. They've not taken the cure. It's not God condemning them. It's sin that does that. Jesus didn't come to condemn. So he came into this world and his life was vicarious. He lived as you just as surely as he died as you. And so we see the public ministry of Jesus launched over in Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> when John, if, chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 13 and going down through verse 17. I want us to consider that passage, Matthew three thirteen through 17. This is the passage about the baptism of Jesus. And it's an interesting passage, Matthew 3, 13 through 17. Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized of him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then... He, John, permitted him. 
after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting upon him. And behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, John is baptizing at the Jordan River. He was the forerunner of Jesus. What was the purpose of John's, the baptism John performed on people? Well, Paul described it in Acts chapter 19 and verse 4 as a baptism of repentance. So John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. What does it mean to repent? To repent means to change your mind. It means that your mind is moving in this direction and you have a radical change of mind so that it turns 180 degrees and your mind now moves in the opposite direction. That's what repentance is. Repentance doesn't mean you change how you act. But now listen carefully. I'll say it a second time. Repentance doesn't mean you change how you act. But listen carefully. When you repent and your mind switches from heading one direction to heading the opposite direction, do you think your actions are going to change too? Of course they are. Of course they will. But the change of behavior is the, the, uh, the side effect. It's the, it's the evidence. It's the after effect of changing your mind. It's not repentance itself. We hear a lot of faulty teaching about repentance these days, saying you can't be a Christian unless you repent. And by that, many will go on to say, and stop doing what you're doing and start doing something different. That is not repentance. That's salvation by works. But it is true that to know Christ, we're going to have to repent. We're going to have to change our mind about the way we've been thinking and think in a different way. But let me tell you, the thing that is missed in the contemporary church is that the greatest fertile field for repentance is the church world. We need to repent. We need to change our mind. I said yesterday in the conference yesterday that so many accuse those of us who teach grace of leaving repentance out of our message. But they say that because they don't have a clue what we're saying. They hear the words, but it's not connecting. Because if they were to hear what we are saying, they would know the irony of it is the very ones who would say that we're not teaching repentance are the ones we're telling you need to repent. Does that make sense? You need to repent. You need to change your mind. And you need to understand that the finished work of Jesus is real and that sin has been dealt with once and for all. We need to change our minds in the modern church about who God is, about what the work of the cross is all about, about our own identity, about what Jesus has done for all of humanity. We need to change our mind about so many things. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. So here comes Jesus in Matthew 3 to be baptized. And John asked a very reasonable question. He asked, he said, wait, 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 wait. You come here where I'm doing, uh, doing this baptism of repentance and you're asking me to baptize you? I, if anything, you need to baptize me. Why? Do you, Jesus, need to be baptized? Why do you, Jesus, need to be baptized? This baptism of repentance. And here's the answer. He didn't. Jesus didn't need to be baptized. But listen, here's the vicarious aspect of his life. Jesus wasn't baptized for himself. The repentance expressed in that baptism wasn't something he was doing for himself. It's something he was doing for you. His repentance is our repentance. And so for me to change my mind in grace doesn't have to be a struggle. For me to change my mind is simply to align my mind with the thoughts and attitudes of Jesus himself. His repentance is my repentance. He was baptized in my place. And when the Father 
saw what he was doing from heaven. This is a, a rich passage of scripture in Matthew 3. It, it, I, I can only imagine it in my mind how that Jesus coming to John to be baptized for you to express repentance on your behalf so that later all you would have to do is just stand with Jesus and say, I'm with him. Listen, there are people that are tormented about this thing. There are people that have trusted Christ and later in their life sometime they'll say this. I've had them say it to me. I don't know if my repentance was sincere. You ever heard that? I don't know if I really meant it. I don't know if it was strong enough or authentic enough or real enough or sincere enough. I've got good news for you. Jesus, he's got your back. He's got your back. Just stand with him. Just say, I'm with him. I'm trusting his repentance. I can just only imagine because... John was trying to make sense out of this and couldn't. Jesus said, allow it to be so now. One translation basically paraphrases to say, there's a big plan here that's a bigger plan than you know, and it's all coming together right now. What was that plan? It was the vicariousness of the baptism of Jesus acting on our behalf, and all of heaven was watching this, and they're looking, and when the Father sees his Son launching this public ministry, and the first thing he does is be baptized in this baptism of repentance on behalf of you and me and everybody. I think all of heaven broke out in applause and God got so excited he couldn't help himself. The father just got so beside himself with pride and excitement about what his boy was doing that he just said, I can't stand it. And he reached down in time and he pulled the curtain apart and from eternity he shouted down into time and said, that's my son. I'm so proud of him. Amen. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> but let me tell you something when the father said this is my son in whom I'm well pleased he was saying that about you Amen. because Jesus was representing you let me give you an illustration of this vicarious aspect of the life of Christ remember when David and Goliath came face to face they come out there and they're standing in uh, and face to face about to go to battle together and here's uh, Goliath you know the giant with all of his girth and height and strength and all of this and here's little David with his sling and his stones and he's standing there and there's a lot at stake right now in that fight but I want you to remember about the fight between David and Goliath that this was not simply a fight between a giant and a little young man a small young man or small boy this was not just a fight between two people there was much more at stake. For David and Goliath, that fight was a fight that was vicarious in nature. In other words, Goliath represented all of the Philistines. And David represented all of Israel, right? So when it was David and Goliath squaring off to fight, it wasn't just two people squaring off to fight. It was the Philistines and Israel about to fight. But it all came to a culmination, a consummation, a, 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 a distilled expression in these people, David and Goliath. And so here's Israel and the Philistines about to fight in the person of David and Goliath. And when Goliath comes out with his sword and his shield... He looks at David and scoffs at him and says, you're going to come out against me? You think you're going to come out against me? And he says, I'll rip you from limb to limb and feed you to the dogs. And David says to him, no, I'm, it's not me that's coming out against you in my own power, but I'm coming out against you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And David swings his sling and he releases one into the strap and that rock sails through the air and implants itself in the head of Goliath. And Goliath falls to the ground and David runs over and with his own sword, he cuts his head off. And when he holds the head of that giant up, you know what was very clear to everybody? Israel had won. And do you know what all those Philistine soldiers did? Do you know what they did when David defeated Goliath? They ran. 
They ran. Did they run because they were afraid of David? They ran because they knew it was over. They had lost. David was Israel. Goliath was all the Philistines. And when Jesus was baptized, his repentance was your repentance. But oh, it gets even better than that. In the life of Jesus, his faith is your faith. Faith. Man, oh man, that's a... Until I understood and began to believe in the vicarious aspect of the faith of Jesus Christ, this would drive me nuts. It really would. I was constantly begging God to give me more faith. Lord, I need more faith. Please, Lord, I need more faith. I need more faith. And if I would pray for something and it wouldn't happen, then I would think, oh, I just didn't have enough faith. Or if somebody else needed something and it didn't materialize, I would think to myself, maybe they didn't have enough faith. And if faith in my mind at that time was a currency that we used to spend and get what we needed from God. And the more faith you had, the bigger things you can get from God. But nothing could be further from the truth, and that is a very condemning, debilitating concept of faith. Let me tell you plain and simple. Faith is not a currency. Faith is Christ Jesus. Paul in Galatians 5, in talking about Jesus, said before faith came, men were shut up under the law, and then he described it. He said, but when faith came, we were released from the law. Now, wait a minute. Under the law in the Old Testament, are you going to tell me that none of those people had faith? Well, yeah, they did. Of course they did. Abraham was known as the father of faith. A lot of those old, Hebrews 11 lists the whole list of, a whole uh, list of names of people who had great faith in the Old Testament. So what did Paul mean when he said before faith came? Well, think of it like this. All that faith he's talking about in the Old Testament, with the Old Testament characters, that's faith with a little f. But when he says in Galatians 5, but when faith came, we were released from the law, think of the word faith with a capital F. And what he was doing there was he was calling Jesus by one of his names, faith. Jesus is your righteousness, Jesus is your peace, Jesus is your power, Jesus is your faith. You have all the faith you need for time and eternity because you have Jesus. He is the one of faith. So that I don't have to muster up more and more faith, I just have to trust Jesus. I was telling somebody yesterday about uh, a retreat I did uh, a couple of years ago now in uh, Oregon with a men's group. It was a strong, charismatic group who uh, who were excited about Jesus and who b- believe in miraculous healing, which I believe in too, and, and uh, they just a strong, enthusiastic group. But this guy, after the afternoon session, comes over to me and he said, let me ask you something. I said, what? He said, How are you at faith for healing? And that's what he said. I said, what? He said, how how is your faith? How are you at faith for healing? And I said, man, I suck at it. I'm horrible. He said, at first he looked like, "Are are you joking? And he could tell, he said, really? I said, yeah, really. I said, man, I prayed for people and they die. I said, I'm, why? Why do you ask? He said, well, I've got this problem in my back, this pain, and it's hurt for about nine months or something like that. And he said, and it's hurt continuously without any relief, and I was hoping you had faith for healing. I said, man, I wish I did. I wish I could help you. I'm sorry, but I just don't. I said, how, how about you? I said, have you prayed about it? He said, yeah, I've prayed about it many times. I said, sheesh, so much for your faith, huh? I said, have you asked other people to pray? He said, yeah. I said, like who? He said, my pastor. He said, I said, he prayed for you? He said, yeah. I said, well, apparently his faith isn't enough either. I said, man, I'm sorry. I said, finally, I said, you know, something comes to mind, though. I said, there is somebody here at this conference that, that I know who's here that has great faith for healing. I said, he's, he's got great faith for healing. I said, maybe we can talk to him. He said, yeah, who is it? I said, it's Jesus. I said, why don't we just talk to him? 
He kind of looked at me. I said, let's just talk to him. And I put my arm on his shoulder, standing by his side. I put my arm around his shoulder, and I said, let's just pray. And I said, Jesus, here's, here's what I prayed. Seriously, I prayed this. I said, Jesus, I hate when you do this to me. I didn't grow up around divine healing. And let me say parenthetically, I didn't. I prayed. I, went, I grew up in churches where... I grew up in church where we prayed for people that were sick. If a guy was in intensive care, we prayed for him during the service on Wednesday night, and then after church, the ladies decided who were going to take the uh, casseroles when he died in a few days. <laughs> I've often said, and I, and I love the folks I grew up in all this, but you'll, they'll, they'll know what I mean by this. I've often said, if I'm laying up there in intensive care, I don't want the people I grew up with praying for me. I want some of these wild-eyed charismatics with blood running out of their ears standing over me praying for me. <laughs> So anyway, I say to this guy, I said, Jesus, I said, I hate when you do this to me. I said, you know, I don't, I, I, this is such an unfamiliar arena to me. I said, I don't, I don't know. This guy's faith isn't doing it. I don't, I don't understand enough to have strong faith. But Jesus, I said, you have enough faith for all of us. And I said, Lord Jesus, we're leaning into your faith. And we're going to rely on your faith. Will you heal this guy's back? Amen. And then I stepped back from the guy. Like I said, he was standing beside me, my arm around him. And I stepped around in front of him, and I took him by the arms on both sides. And I shook him, and I said, <laughs> He looked at me, and I said, Man, I know how you guys are. If I didn't do a Benny Hinn number on you, you wouldn't feel like you'd been prayed for. <laughs> he laughed, and I laughed. Of course, he knew I was just joking around. I walked away. He went away. Next morning, I'm sitting in the dining hall. It was a retreat center, and I'm sitting in the dining ho- sitting in the dining hall eating. And this guy comes in across the dining hall, way across, and I see him come in, and I catch his eye, and he's looking at me, and I smile, and he kind of nod, and he smiles, and he's I see he's making a beeline right for me, and I think, man, he's psyched about something. So in a minute, he gets over there to where I am. He walks up to me. He says, man, I got to tell you something. I said, what? He said, you're not going to believe this. He said, but when I, after we prayed yesterday, he said, when I walked away from you, I realized my back was not hurting at all, and it has not hurt at all since then. And I just went, I don't know. <laughs> he is our faith. And you know what? I, I don't claim to have it all right on, on this because there's a lot, a lot of gaps in my own mind. So sometimes I say more than I know, but I'm telling you what I think right now. I'm kind of at the place where when I can't have faith for a certain outcome, I know I at least can have trust in the one I'm asking. And I, and, I, and I know. I've still got a lot of maturing to do in this area. I know I do. I'm saying it. And I know it's the truth. I'm not feigning humility. I mean it. I've got a lot of growing to do in this area. But when I don't have faith for a certain outcome, I don't, know, I don't understand outcome and, and all of them have failed, how faith can it, I don't understand all of it but one thing I do know is I can trust my father because he loves me and I can trust Jesus and I can lean into him and his faith because it's not my faith if it's my faith I'm in trouble and everybody who wants me to help or pray for them or do anything on their behalf toward God they're in trouble too they're barking up the wrong tree they're asking a poor man to loan them to give them a loan so I just admit I'm poor and I Say, let's go talk to the one that's rich. It's not my faith. Paul said it like this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. This is King James Version. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The King James gets it right when, he, they, when it records Paul saying, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Some translations render that, I live by faith in the Son of God. But that's a faulty translation. If you have something like a, maybe the New American Standard or New International, I don't remember which one say faith in, but it's a faulty translation. The original language doesn't say I have faith, I live by faith in the Son of God. It says I live by the faith of the Son of God. Jesus is our faith. Romans 3.26 says, I say of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has the faith of Jesus Christ or the faith of Jesus. Some translations say faith in Jesus. Romans 3.26, we're justified by the faith of Jesus, Paul says. 
It's the exact construction in the original language that you find in Romans 4 and verse 16 where Paul said, For this reason it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, here's what I want you to see. In Romans 4.16, Paul speaks about the faith of Abraham. And that's how every translation will, will translate it. The faith of Abraham. But when those same translators talk about our justification, back in Romans 3.26... They say we're justified, and they translate it as we're justified by the faith in Jesus Christ. So they change it. Don't ever think a translator doesn't have a bias. They don't try to translate in a wrong way. I speak all over Latin America, and I know conversational Spanish enough. I can have conversation with somebody, but I can't preach in Spanish. I'm not that fluent. And so when I'm teaching or preaching in, in, in Latin America... Unless my Latin American director is translating for me, who's flawless at it, if I have somebody else that translates, there have been times I'll be preaching and I'll say something and they'll say the wrong thing. And they'll just say one word different and I'll say, no, no, no. And I'll correct what they said because that changing that one word can make a meaning, a difference, a difference in what it means. So if you look at this, that the faith of Abraham and compare it to Romans 3.26 where Paul said we're justified by, justified by faith of Jesus. Some say faith in Jesus. That becomes important. In Romans 3.26, the, listen to the two phrases. You don't have to know Greek to, to understand, to hear the two phrases. Faith of Jesus in Romans 3.26 in the original language is Ekpistios Yesu. Ekpistios Yesu. But what they is translated as faith of Abraham is Ekpistios Abram. Now listen to the two phrases and tell me the difference in the two phrases. Ekpistios Yesu. Ekpistios Abram. What's the difference? There is one difference. What is it? The name, Ekpistias Yesu, Ekpistias Abram. That's the only difference, right? And it means the faith of Jesus, the faith of Abraham, but some translators say the faith, our, our faith in Jesus. Let me tell you something. We are not justified by faith in Jesus. We are justified by the faith of Jesus. Now, I know this is where people like me are accused of being a universalist. I'm not a universalist, and I'm sick of having to say that, but I'll say it. I don't know how long I'll keep saying it. I don't know. It's insecurities that make me say it, and I wish God would free me from that, where I don't give a crap what people think anymore, but I, I can't help it. I still care. I, yeah, I hadn't arrived either. So anyway, some people say, well... If you believe everybody has been justified by Christ, then you, you just believe everybody's going to heaven. I never said that. I never said that whatsoever. But I'm not, but I'm not going to deny what the Bible says. No. You, you say, so Steve, do you believe there are justified people, people have been reconciled, people that have been justified by God, who will experience hell and not heaven? That's exactly what I believe. That's exactly what I believe. And let me tell you, once again, God's faithfulness doesn't depend on our faith. If we are faithless, He is faithful still, the Bible says. Now, God has done what He has done for us, and if I don't receive it, back to Hebrews 4 2, I won't benefit from it. In fact, if God loves somebody who has nothing but contempt and scorn toward Him, that very love can be held to that person. I've had people criticize, say, oh, Steve McVeigh preaches some kind of lovey-dovey hell. Let me, tra- let me tell you, you don't want to experience hell. You don't want to experience hell. A lot of folks are beginning to get a taste of what that's like in this world. You don't want to, you don't want to see that increase in intensity all into it, in and through eternity. No, 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 no. 
I'm not saying everybody's going to heaven, but I'm saying you, you can't lie about what the Bible says. And I have to say what I know is true, no matter who likes it and who doesn't like it, or I'm going to quit doing what I'm doing, and I'm going to go on back down there to Florida where we lived a few years ago and sell timeshares because I think I could do a good job with that. <laughs> but I'm not planning to do that. I'd rather tell people about the love of the Father. His faith is vicarious. And yes, we must re accept his acceptance, but I don't live by my own faith. It's not something I have to work up. It's not something I have to generate. I rest simply in the faith of Jesus Christ. So, even now in my own life, there are times that I feel very weak in faith. There are times I feel weak in many ways. Do you? There are times my peace is wobbly. There are times my sense of power, spiritual power, feels wobbly. There are times my sense level of faith feels wobbly and low. So I don't pray, Lord, give me more of that. Give me more. Get, Lord, give me peace. Paul said about Jesus that Christ himself is our peace. Well, I already have him. So if I have him, then I have peace. Paul said in Galatians 5, before faith came, but when faith came, we're no longer under the law. I have faith because I have Jesus. I have peace because I have Jesus. I have power because I have Jesus. Let's stop praying and even thinking from this mentality of deficiency, which would lead us to believe that there's something out there that we need God to give us. I'm going to tell you, I've got bad news and good news. The bad news is this, God's not going to give you anything else. He's done with giving. That's the bad news. But the bad news really is a gateway to the good news because the good news is this. He's already given you everything in Christ Jesus. You already have it. You already have it. And, we're, and, and, and when we, we need to quit praying, Lord, give me peace. Lord, give me faith. Lord, give me power. Lord, give me anything. We need to instead recognize what's already ours. The problem that exists among many, quote, believers, end quote, is that we don't believe it. Or we don't see it. And because we don't see it, we don't believe it. It makes me think of uh, a time not long ago. My wife, Melanie, was back in the back of the house, and I was in the kitchen. And I said, I called out to her, and I said, Melanie. She said, yeah, I said, where are those potato chips that go with this dip in the refrigerator? She said, they're in the cupboard. I said, oh. Well, I said, I don't see them. She said, they're in there. They're in the cupboard. I said, okay. So I go back over to the cupboard again, and I open it up, and I look. I don't see the potato chips anywhere. I called back. I said, Melanie, they're not here. She said, yes, they are. They're, they're in the cupboard. I said, are you sure? She said, yes. I said, okay. So I look back in there. No potato chips in there. So I walked back there and said, Melanie, I said, are you sure the potato chips are in there? She said, yeah. I said, where? She said, one of those top shelves. I said, okay. So I go back in there and I look. There are no potato chips. So I don't say anything. I just walk back in the back of the house and I sit down and going to do whatever I was doing back there. She said, you didn't get the chips? I said, there are some potato chips in there. I said, you know. They're, they're, she said, Steve, they're, they're on that second shelf. And I go back in there, and I'm looking in that cupboard, and I think, now this is, she's losing it. I think she's giving those grandchildren these potato chips and forgotten she's done it, or I, I, I don't know why, I don't know why she keeps telling me this when they're not. So I go back there again. She says, did you not get the chips? I said, there are no chips in there. And I don't know how it happened, but she walked back into that kitchen and I walked back in there behind her because I'm going to gloat over this. I walked back in there, and I don't know if it was a demon. I don't know if it was a reverse burglar. I don't know what it was. But she opened that cupboard and reached right out and picked up those potato chips, rolled her eyes the way a wife will do after 40 years of marriage, and hands me the chips. I was living with a lack, a sense of lack, with a sense of deficiency because I wanted something that I couldn't see. 
And so I concluded it's not there. And it took revelation (laughs) for her to lead me back in there, open the door, and me watch her reach out and grab those chips that had been there all along and put them in my hand. I want to tell you something. That's what a lot of us need when it comes to faith and a lot of other things. We need to realize that what we think we lack, we don't lack. We already have it. We just need the revelation of the reality of what we already possess. And we need to rest in that revelation. The vicariousness of the life of Jesus. Now you know about the vicarious death of Jesus. I've said his repentance is your repentance. His faith is your faith. I could go. I could talk about many things. I could talk about his obedience. What if, what if, just think of this for a moment. What if obedience wasn't something you have to struggle to do? What if obedience is as simple as this? What if obedience was just realizing Jesus was perfectly obedient? In fact, he was obedient unto death, even death on the cross, Paul said. And what if I could quit worrying about uh, scrutinizing my every thought, word, and deed, and I could just actually take my eyes off myself and my performance, and what if I could look at the perfect, flawless performance of Jesus and say, you know what, I'm just going to step over here and depend on his obedience. What difference would that make? A legalist might think, well, that would cause the person to go out and sin and misbehave and think, well, it doesn't matter if I obey or not. But let me tell you something. Anybody that would think that doesn't understand grace at all. Because Paul wrote to Titus and he said, The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and how to live soberly and righteous and just in this present age. Grace teaches and motivates and equips you to live a godly lifestyle. If we take our eyes off ourselves and quit fretting about our own obedience and instead just step over here and rest in the obedience of Christ, guess what? When I feel it difficult to be obedient, all I have to do is step over here and kind of cling to Jesus in faith and say, I better depend on your obedience right now. It's like the old guy said about the uh, the, the, the revelation of the obedience of Christ and how he'll do it for us. He said, it used to be when temptation came and knocked at my door, I would open the door and say, I can't go. I shouldn't go. I'd, I'd like to, but I can't. I, it's, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a believer. I shouldn't. I can't. No, I better not. I want to, but I better not. No. And he said it was a constant struggle. He said, but when I understood this truth of the vicarious aspect of the obedience of Jesus, now when temptation knocks at the door, I just look at Jesus and say, Lord, would you answer that? (laughs) There's a difference right there. He lived as you. He didn't just live for you and die for you. He lived as you and died as you. When he was obedient, that was your obedience. When he expressed faith, that was your faith. When he was baptized, that was your baptism of repentance. When he surrendered to his Father, that was your surrender. When he died, that was your death. When he was buried, that was your burial. When he was resurrected, that was your resurrection. When he ascended, that was your ascension. And the person that any of us were in Adam is dead because that person died. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. And now you have been raised up together with him in a newness of life so that you are literally, as Paul said, a new creation. To create means to bring into existence something out of nothing. He didn't revise and upgrade who you were. It's not like moving up to iOS 7 from the the lesser version. No, you got a whole new drive. And you're not who you used to be anymore. You are as righteous as he is. You were as holy as he is because he is your holiness. You don't want a scale of 1 to 100% how holy you are. 100%. I was in India, and I was in Delhi, New Delhi, in a crowded marketplace, and I heard this guy calling out, Sir, sir, sir. And I turned and looked, and he was, and sure enough, he was calling out to me. I said, Me? He said, Yes. He said, Come over here to me. I said, Me? He said, Yes, come over here to me. I said, What do you want? (coughs) He said, Come over here to me. I'll be telling you your future. (laughs) 
I said, I, I don't need you to do that. Thanks, but I already know my future. He said, no, you don't know your future. I know your future. I'll be telling you your future. Come here to me. I said, I know my future. He said, no, you don't, but I know your future. I said, what makes you think you know my future? I promise this is a true story. The guy said, because I am a holy man. I said, what? He said, I'm a holy man. I said, I'm a holy man. <laughs> he said, no, you're not. I said, yes, it was, it was good nature. We were both smiling. Good nature in exchange. He said, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am, really. He said, no, you're not. I said, I am, really. I promise, I'm a holy man. He said, no. He said, come over here to me. I'll, I'll prove it to you. And I walk over to the guy, and when I walk over to him, he reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out a business card, and he shows it to me, and on the top it had his name. I'm not kidding. Under it, it said, holy man. <laughs> I said, well, I don't have a business card to prove I'm a holy man, but I have a Christian Bible that guarantees I'm a holy man. And you know what? So are you. You are holy because his resurrection was yours. And you've been raised, and now you're in union with him so that his life is yours. You are a saint. That's what the word holy is. Hagios, saint, you're holy. This is where I differ. Some, some of my friends who embrace Trinitarianism, this is where I differ with some of them. Because some still hold on to the old idea that, we'll, that we are simultaneously sinners and saints. I don't believe that. I don't believe we are simultaneously sinners and saints. I think the old sinner identity died in Jesus Christ and with Christ. And when we were raised up, we've been raised up, we're 100% righteous. We're righteous to the core. We are righteous to the core. That's who you are. I didn't say you always act that way or think that way or feel that way. I'm not professing that about myself either. But I'm saying how you act, think, and feel doesn't define you. Your birth in Jesus Christ is what defines you. Birth defines you, not behavior. And we have been given a living hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. We've been born again in his resurrection. And we've got a new identity. So we're holy. We're righteous. We're saints. We're one with God. He who joins himself together to the Lord is one spirit with him. Christ is not in your life. Christ is your life. You're one with him. You're seated with him in the heavenly places. It's already done. All of it is finished. And the only thing left for any of us to do is to, proclaim, to believe and then proclaim the good news of the finished work of Jesus Christ so that we and others might come into the full understanding and revelation and faith experience of what Christ has done on our behalf. When I don't experience peace, that doesn't mean that Mr. Peace doesn't still live inside me. Because peace is a man named Jesus. And I said, yes, a man. He's the God man. He'll forever be a man. And he'll forever be God. He mediates the peace of the Godhead in me. And he mediates my concerns and my prayers and my hopes and my desires back to the Father. And then my triune God mediates back through the Spirit of Jesus in me a gentle shh. It's okay. It's okay. I got it. It's all right. And when I don't feel peace, it's not because I don't have it. When I don't feel faith, it's not because I don't have it. When I don't feel, you name it, joy, power, whatever. When I don't feel it, it's not because I don't have it. The need is to awaken and come alive and grow in my knowledge of Jesus and the grace of the Father expressed through him in the Spirit. And as I grow in that, then that takes more and more of the territory of my soul, which is my mind, will, and emotions. There's where the battle is fought. And as I believe and grow in the knowledge of him and who he is, it expands through my soul, my mind, will, and emotions. And then it finds expression in my lifestyle. You don't need anything. You've got everything. Paul said, I remember one time when I was still a local pastor, I was praying at church before I went in to preach. And I said, Lord, would you please just move in this service and would you give us what we need today? Just give us everything we need in this service. And I was praying, and the Holy Spirit 
uh, as I was finished praying, I was looking at the Scripture, and the Holy Spirit brought me to Ephesians 1.3 where the Bible says that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. That's past tense. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. And it's like I heard the Lord say, I'm not going to give, give you all anything today. I've already given it. So instead of going in there and challenging people to ask me to give them something, go in there and proclaim to them what I've already given them. You, you can't be given something you've got. You've gotten. I was looking for my sunglasses one day when I was down in Florida. I went into the room by the recliner and looked there and I couldn't find them. I went into the bedroom and I looked on the night table by my bed and I couldn't find them. I thought maybe I put them on the kitchen counter. I went in there. I made the same mistake. I'm a slow learner. I called out to my wife, have you seen my sunglasses? <laughs> She said, I haven't seen them. Thankfully, she was in the back. I looked and looked. I tilted the recliner up. I thought, I only wear them right here. I tilted the recliner up to see if they were under the chair. They weren't there. Finally, I thought, I don't think I would have worn my sunglasses into the bathroom, to the toilet, but I, it's the only other place I can think. So I went into the bathroom, and I walked over to the toilet, and I looked on the back of the toilet lid, and I looked all around the floor, and I'd looked everywhere for those sunglasses trying to find them. It's not that big a place. I couldn't figure out where they were. And I walked over to look on the counter around the sink, and I glanced up in the mirror. <laughs> I've got good news for you. You can quit looking. You can quit praying. You can quit about give me, give me, give me. You can quit hoping. And just look and realize you already have it. And not only do you have it, but this gift of God in Jesus Christ is one that is good news of glad tidings to all men. And that's the gospel we proclaim. Yeah. Let's pray together, shall we? I pray today that if you have come in with a sense of deficiency and lack, that the Lord will lift that off of you before you leave this building. That he'll just take it off of you. Because I tell you, in him you lack nothing. You have everything you need. You lack nothing. So just thank him for it. Thank him for the abundant faith, the abundant level of repentance and joy and power and everything. Think about your own life. Think about the areas where you, you have felt deficient. You felt you needed more of this or more of that. Think about that. And then thank him that you have all you need of that very thing in Jesus Christ. There are things I don't understand. I can't connect the dots between what I know to be true and my own experience sometimes. I can't do it. I just can't sort it out in my head. But let me tell you something. I've come to a place where when I don't know the answer to why or I don't know the answer to what I need to do or I don't know the answer to how I can see it manifest, I do know the answer to who, and the answer is him. So let's lean into him. Father, in Jesus' name, empower us to trust you, to trust you, and to see our completeness in Christ. Thank you for being the vicarious one who has offered yourself and given us in you, in your own life, perfect obedience, repentance, faith, death to sin, resurrection to new life, and victory in the ascension that we share with you. May we live out of that identity every day. Amen. Amen.